Time and time again, I encounter young men and young women on college campuses, on university campuses, and they tell me over and over, I don't have any problems with Jesus. I have problems with religion. And this is a generation that is more and more spiritual and less and less religious because they don't see people living out the radical commands of Jesus. What Jesus asks people to do for the poor and the oppressed is something that needs to be done if Jesus is to be taken seriously. That's what this program is about, taking Jesus seriously. Welcome, glad you're here. And uh, we're going to have a good time together as we talk about Red Letter Christianity. We're really going to be talking about people who take the words of Jesus very literally and try to live out the teachings of Jesus without compromise. And we have an interesting and important, more important, is she's important, an important guest today. Tell us about her. I'm excited. Felina Hewitts is one of those folks that's been thinking about how we pray and just as important, how we get off our knees and we act on our prayers and join God's work in the world. So she talks a lot about putting prayer into action and seeing prayer not as just something we're trying to convince God to do what we want God to do, but to become the kind of people that God wants us to become. The great saints of the world have always emphasized that, haven't they? That true prayer always results in action. Hmm. And uh, young people all over the country are saying, I want to do things for God, but I don't know about all this prayer stuff, all of this pious, uh, contemplative praying. I mean, it doesn't sound like it would result in anything significant, but uh, you're telling us that our guest is going to say just the opposite. Absolutely. I think what I've learned from Felina is she says, sometimes when you say to God, where are you? God's asking the same question. Where are you? You're, you're down here to be my hands and feet. So, and, so let's and this uh, word made flesh thing is like small groups of young people living together in community uh, in various uh, places around the world. I think it's some um, word made flesh. The organization that Felina is a part of is really on the cutting edge of thinking through what it means to be missional in the world that we're living in. Not just seeing missions as a little trip you do in the summer, but as something we do with our entire lives. Yeah. You know, more and more young people are looking at living in community and they evidently have embraced this. What we mean yeah. is that they live together. You know, during the 60s, there were the communes uh, with the hippies. I've heard of them. Yeah. yeah. You look like you would have, <laughs> you really are out of the 60s. I, I got to tell you, you that. You just don't have enough hair to pull Well, off, it, but, it's been yeah. raptured. It's been caught up to be with God in heaven. But uh, young people today are beginning to say, hey, the time has come for us to take another look at living in community, living together, sharing our resources, being brothers and sisters in Christ. And uh, this group, uh, Word Made Flesh, has been a model for this. Uh, they have a video, and we're going to look at that right now, uh, that'll tell us something about Word Made Flesh, and then we're going to introduce our guest. What is Word Made Flesh? Word Made Flesh is a uh, community of Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, and Evangelical Christians who are vocationally called committed to serving Christ among the most vulnerable of the world's poor. It's being the hands that feed uh, the eyes, the ears of God. They bring love into places where people um, have a hard time finding love. It takes a lot of different shapes uh, depending on the, the country and on the individuals, on the needs that are represented in that community. Our communities are spread out all around the world, South America, South Asia, Eastern Europe, West Africa. We work with children who live and work on the streets or in sewers. We work with children who've been forced to fight in civil wars. We work with women and children who've been trafficked um, into the commercial sex industry where up to 15, 20 times a day they're, they're forced to sell sex to, to, to feed themselves and their families. Our projects are, are children's homes for kids who have been orphaned because of AIDS or children who are HIV positive themselves. And, and, and over the years we've buried a lot of our, our little friends, kids that we've named, kids that we've, we've made home for. We uh, set up community centers and drop-in centers for youth that live and work on the streets or in sewers or in slums. And, and some of our staff are social workers or educators or, or health care providers. But a lot of our staff um, just sort of accompany the kids. And uh, it's just in conversation. And, and it's provoking hopes. And it's 
and it's remembering dreams and it's just saying what is it going to take right for you to become the person that you want to be word made flesh is an international community that joins together with victims of poverty to work toward transformation and not only um, the transformation of the one who is uh, subjected to injustice and poverty but our transformation and so what we find is that as we build community together um, between the rich and the poor that we um, we both benefit from God's transforming action in our life we do this very slowly we do this very thoughtfully we do this in a way that ascribes dignity affirms the divine imprint of God in humanity and that uh, bears witness to hope my birth mother is a sex worker and a few years about three years old I was put into an orphanage and then I was brought to the United States and then once I made it to the US I spent most of my childhood in the foster care system and my story isn't glamorous but their stories were more atrocious than anything I experienced and I've met girls who have been physically emotionally and sexually abused in the most horrific ways and so I've spent my whole life hearing stories um, and seeing what it's done to people I, how could I not do something about that? It's a fascinating sort of paradox. The scripture talks that one day we're actually going to be around a table and feast with people from every nation, language, and tribe. But we now live in a world where two-thirds of those people don't eat today. So, that's, that both breaks my heart as well as it encourages me that the work isn't done yet and there's always work to do. It's, it's back to the very basics. It's back to what Christ did. It's, you know, coming, living among people, being committed to people, having authentic relationships, and just being who God made you to be. And uh, I think before I came to Word Made Flesh, I didn't think I had much to offer. Um, but it uncovers what you have to offer. Word Made Flesh is like this gigantic puzzle, you know, and it's like you can't do without one piece of the puzzle. And so I think when you are giving to Word Made Flesh, you are a part of that puzzle. Like, we can't, we can't operate without you, so we need you, you know, like, if we're going to create this masterpiece, you know, if we're going to create something great, you have to be involved, you know, we can't do it alone. Our human love is so finite, but when, when I look at the love God has for us, it, it, goes, it goes all the way, whatever that means. Um, it reaches into the darkest places of our own spirits and our lives. It reaches into the darkest places that this world has. And it compels some of us in Inward May Flesh to go to those places as well. Felina, thanks for joining us on the show, and it's, it's powerful work, some of the most redemptive work and some of the most forsaken places on earth uh, that you're doing, and we want, we want to hear about that, but first tell us like a little of your own story and how you got into the work and the, the, the reflection that you're doing on prayer. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really crazy, you know, when I, when I watch that video and I realize where I've come from, it's remarkable. Sometimes it feels sort of like an out of body experience, right? Because I'm just like, this is my life, seriously? I grew up in a really small community in Indiana. My father was a pastor, um, really conservative, quite sheltered childhood and experience and went to a Christian liberal arts college. Again, um, rather sheltered of an experience. Uh, but I was nurtured by some really great people, people who followed God with all of their heart. and. Um, received a call to go into the world and to be among people of other cultures and particularly people of poverty. And that happened in college and um, it was just life altering, right? I had never gotten on an airplane until I was, I think, a junior in college. Nowadays, people are flying all the time, right? What was it in college? Uh, yeah. You went to a good yeah. college, Asbury College, yeah. uh, now Asbury University. What was it that happened there mm. that really changed you and got you thinking mm. in this uh, rather countercultural way? Yeah. Well, you know, actually, 
When I was a child, I remember um, at a very young age thinking I wanted to be a missionary. When all of my classmates were talking about, I want to be a doctor, a lawyer, whatever, I was like, inside I was like, I want to be a missionary. Uh, but I was kind of embarrassed to say that, right? But in college um, was really when I got to meet a lot of people who had chosen sort of a radical way of life that wasn't the, the normal sort of mainstream, you know, doctor, lawyer, teacher kind of route. And I think their influence really inspired me and um, made me think outside the box of what is possible and how God might want to use me. Hmm. And, and then as you got into this, how, how did your thinking about missions change? Because I know when I grew up thinking about missions, it was something that you did short term and not something you did with your whole life. But it seems like your heartbeat's been missions mm -hmm. is a way of life, not just a, a little trip. That's right. Mission is totally a way of life. It's, it's, it's you know, Jesus' life was all about mission, right? And I don't think we have to be some special kind of radicalized person who goes to a foreign country to be someone who's called to mission. I think mission is written on our hearts. I think we all have a particular calling that God has made us for a particular kind of way to engage the world. And that is living mission. That is living your purpose. That is letting God live God's life through us in the world, making real change. But most of the people who are with Word Made Flesh, your movement, I don't want to call it an organization because knowing you and now knowing your husband, uh, you're anything but uh, the traditional uh, kind of person. You, you live in an intentional community. Most of these Word Made Flesh groups are in various places around the world. Uh, uh, you're noted for connecting prayer uh, with, with, with action. Yeah. Uh, how did that come about? Yeah, that's right. Well, I think that our community is, is quite special because of the people who have been available to us and have influenced us. So in the very early days, Mother Teresa was a huge influence for us. She was quite the mentor. And uh, growing up in an evangelical kind of background, um, working with Mother Teresa in Calcutta, uh, the missionaries of charity coming from a Catholic order, that was really unusual and quite new to us. But just by watching how the missionaries of charity engaged the poorest of the poor in the city and really married their prayer life with their work spoke volumes to us. I think in our, in our early 20s, I don't think we could fully understand what that meant. But over time, you know, I've been in this work now 20 years, almost 20 years, and um, over time, those lessons that I learned in the early years from Mother Teresa started to become more real for me. Okay, like, like what lessons? What, you learned something about prayer. I mean, yeah. I, you know, I pray. I, I read off my list of non-negotiable demands to the Almighty. Uh, yeah. and, uh, but you obviously learned something else about prayer uh, in, in your journey. And could you share that with us? Yeah. And, and yeah. how prayer has changed for you and what the nature of prayer is for you. Yeah, sure. Probably uh, the first eight years of, of my work with Word Made Flesh was really intense. You know, I, I went into various cities around the world, some of the poorest cities in the world in Asia, Eastern Europe, South America, West Africa, saw some horrific suffering. And, um, you know, I was because my husband and I were overseeing the movement, we were responsible to go in and out of these places and establishing these communities, working with our partners on the ground. And after about eight years, um, I hit a breaking point. Um, there was a lot of activism. There was a lot of being present to the very intense needs of the world, right? And um, it was when we made our first visit to Freetown, Sierra Leone, at the it was really the, the height of the war over blood diamonds in Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone if you remember that war, there's a film about it. Um, just horrible atrocities happening in that country. I think it was in 2002 that we made that visit. And just, I mean, awful, awful human suffering. You know, refugees from the country pouring into the capital city, victims of amputation. Uh, both the rebels and the government soldiers were using um, this tactic of amputating arms and legs to instill fear and control. And even worse, you know, the, the soldiers would take the children of the family and force them to do the amputations of their parents. And they would capture the young girls. And um, these young girls would become what they call war brides, so basically sex slaves for the soldiers. And we visited uh, one of the refugee camps and met a lot of these young girls that had been captured like that and terribly mistreated and 
raped and brutalized. And I was just, it was just like, I can't take any more, right? I'd seen so much suffering in the world, and now this was like the worst of the worst. And then a little bit later, we go into um, a camp where they were, display they were um, disarming the soldiers. So a lot of the children were coming out of the, the ranks, and, and the UN was disarming them and trying to get them integrated back into society. And here I meet these soldiers that had done the, the horrible, brutal things to these girls. And then I hear their story, right, of how they were just like, they were forced into this. They were also victims. And so it was, it was awful. And I, and I couldn't make sense of it. And I was wondering, where is God in this, right? And I came home and was um, relaying the story to some friends around our dining table. And my friend looked at me and she said, do you ever doubt the goodness of God? And I said, yes with tears, you know, coming out of my eyes, feeling like this was a confession. Look, I'm a Christian. I've been a Christian all my life. I'm doing these wonderful things around the world. How can I doubt the goodness of God? Well, it wasn't long after that that I realized that at some point, the practices that have sustained us tend to fall short. Mm -hmm. And that's actually an invitation to go deeper with God. And so I began to learn about the rich tradition of contemplative prayer in, in our Christian history. What in the world is contemplative <laughs> prayer? Yeah, contemplative prayer, you know? We are really accustomed to praying um, in a way that's all about conversation. What we're saying to God and what we're trying to hear from God. That's great, and that has a place in our life. Um, contemplative prayer is, is a way to rest in God. It's a way to learn to just be. It's uh, characterized by practices like silence, solitude, and stillness. And these qualities are something that our society really uh, works against, right? It's very hard to find silence, solitude, and stillness and to really mm. value that. But that, in that kind of prayer, that is where I found a way to be sustained in the world and not only sustained in my activism, but really thrive. Oh. You know, I, I, I spent time in, in Calcutta, too, and it's one of the places that I, I learned that, and I feel like you've learned that, too, is that every morning in Calcutta, Mother Teresa and the sisters would spend massive amounts of time just in prayer, in silence, and then we would end the day with adoration, looking at the cross, mm -hmm. and I'm like, what, what, is, what is that? And they mm -hmm. said, well, we're just spending time with the one we love. Yeah. And, and, and it's almost like you, you don't have to have a lot of words for that. You can just sit at the cross and think about Jesus. And is, that, that's kind of where I had my eyes open to this yeah. kind of way of praying. What, 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 what are some other ways that that looks like for you? Like, mm. what, what does it look like to, mm. to, to pray now? Yeah, you know, I love that story of, of Mother Teresa and the Missionaries of Charity in Calcutta because also what I witnessed was in the house for the dying where people are literally dying mm -hmm. every moment. You know, they need, they need continual attention. During the day, during their work day, the sisters would quietly remove themselves from the house for the dying and go upstairs to a room and for adoration. And I thought, now wait a minute, look at all these needs. How can you go off and into your quiet place and pray? There's work to be done, right? But I've learned that that is absolutely central to living our life with authentic faith in the world. That taking that time out, going before God in the midst of so many needs, the needs are there and we need to attend to them, but we also have needs. And it's in that quiet place that God can get to us in a way that, that we don't allow God to get to us in our very active, busy, heroic kinds of activism. What, what does it really look like though to, to do that? Because I think some folks when they're getting going, they're like, so what are you saying? I just like get on my knees and I <laughs> sit for 20 minutes. Right. Like, like I, and I, I have a friend that's a monk that said uh, one time they were in prayer and he got on his knees and bowed down and like an hour later, one of his friends said, you're such a powerful prayer. And he's like, no, brother, I just fell asleep. You know, but, but, <laughs> yeah, like, right. what, 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 yeah. like, what, how does it like, you know, like it's not just sitting in silence. It's more than that, right? That's right. Well, there are four um, ancient prayer practices, which really we need to think of this prayer as more, dis as more like discipline than prayer as we're used to. So it is a, a practice of discipline. There are four that I really recommend. Centering prayer, Lexio Divina, breath prayer coming from the East Orthodox um, Jesus prayer, and then the prayer of examine. Uh, centering prayer, I, I could tell a little bit about, is, is really just a way to sit in silence. And so um, you, you have a sacred word that becomes your symbol to consent 
to the action of God within you. Now this is very different than telling God a lot of things or trying to hear from the voice of God. It is a discipline of making room in our heart to consent to God's action within us. We know God dwells within us. Do you feel anything? Uh, if, if you do, yeah, you can feel things, but if you do, you're just meant to let it go. It's not a time to really reflect or analyze or think about what you're experiencing. It's a time to just open up and discipline yourself to be present to God, to just be, learn how to just be. And, and so someone is going, I, I have no idea where to start. Like you sound like a prayer expert. I, I don't even know how to start talking to God. What would you say? I would say, stop talking to God. <laughs> and I would say, just find five minutes to just sit with quiet attention and invite God to just be with you and let yourself be with God. And as the thoughts come, return to this sacred word as your symbol of surrender. Hmm. It's really about that. These disciplines are about surrendering to the presence of God in our life. That's really good. Uh, as you were talking, the two things that came to my mind, uh, since Mother Teresa was so much a part of this conversation, mm -hmm is uh, they asked her on a television interview, uh, when you pray, what do you say to God? And she said, I don't say anything, I listen. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the interviewer said, okay, when you pray, what does God say to you? And she said, God doesn't say anything, God mm -hmm. listens. Mm -hmm. And then added, if you don't understand that, I can't explain it to you. Mm -hmm. That's right. The other thing that came to my mind as you were speaking is that this taps into some of the old gospel songs that I grew up with. Mm -hmm. uh, remember, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Mm -hmm. Look full in his wonderful face, this adoration thing you were talking about. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And then the old one that my mother used to sing all the time, I come to the garden alone mm -hmm. and he, you know, I'm there alone and the sound of his voice. And of mm -hmm. course, there is no sound. Yeah. Uh, the birds hush their singing and the joy we share as we tarry there. Yeah. Those old hymns sometimes captured what you're talking about. Uh, but maybe you got a story of how this relates into action. Mm, totally. So, uh, you know, really this kind of prayer is about letting God transform us mm. from the inside out so that our active life can be even more transformational in the world. And so, you know, when we are spending time in this kind of quality prayer, then we are our actions are more purified. You know, I, I see a lot of good things happening on behalf of, of my friends in poverty, but I've also seen how some of the best intentions can cause more harm than good. It's easy to pick on those who've gone before us, some of the colonialism that stripped people of their culture and um, that kind of thing. But even today, you know, what is it that we're doing that we think is so good that history will say something else about us? Um, and so I think as we go into our active life, as we are committed to letting God purify us, letting the fruit of the Spirit become more evident in our life, then our actions are going to be more loving, more kind, more purified, that kind of thing. And, and do, so now after years of doing this, does it, do you have, are you able to make any more sense out of suffering? I mean, do you still doubt God's goodness when you see a, a, a little girl that's been raped or someone whose arm's been mm -hmm. chopped off or like yeah. terrible things like how, how does your prayer life now help you make sense of the, yeah. the world we live in? Yeah, you know, um, I think it's, it's less about making sense of the world and through this prayer I'm able to be present to the world as it is. Mm. And that doesn't mean I condone or just you know, grow lazy and not do anything. It's not like that. It's about being present and accepting both the pain and the joy in the world and then letting God respond instead of me react. And I think a lot of times in our social activism, it is a lot of reaction. And, and I would like to be in a place where I could respond, letting Jesus respond through me to the world. It's a really, it's a really great point you brought up because I think a lot of times our response is either I've got to do something as if there's no God or mm -hmm. God, you got to do something as if there's no me, you know? Yeah, and, and, right. and, and so like a lot of folks are so active that they've forgotten to pray and some folks are so prayerful that you know they're never going to act. You know, someone says, I'll pray for you and you go, oh geez, then that's, nothing's ever going to get done, you know? Right. So, so how do we put those together? Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful. You, you, 
you have how many groups like uh, Word Made Flesh communities around the world? How many are there, there are now? Thirteen. Thirteen, and there's about how many in each of them? Oh, it varies from ten to sixty or seventy, or even more. Yeah. Yeah, and I need for our listeners and watchers to know that uh, if they go to our website, uh, redletterchristians.org, mm -hmm. uh, you can uh, get information about this. Uh, we will make sure that information is available mm -hmm. because there are going to be some young people out there who want to be a part of this, yeah. uh, who say this is exactly what I'm looking for, mm -hmm. some depth. Well, you're certainly a Red Letter Christian, taking the words of Jesus seriously, mm -hmm. and because of that, I'm giving you a wristband, <laughs> and you, you can wear it proudly for yourself and the kingdom. Oh, okay. Thanks for being our guest. Welcome to Red Letter Christianity, and we just had a great conversation with a, a guest uh, named Felina Hewart from Word Made Flesh, and a great thinker on prayer. Got my my prayer juice is flowing here. I, 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 I'm remembering this letter I got, Tony, from a, um, uh, a kid that said, I find myself very alone nowadays, alone in this world of inactive believers and unbelieving activists. Mm -hmm. Where are the people who put prayer and action back together? Yeah. And that's really what we've been talking about today. You know, uh, there's that verse in the 40th chapter of uh, Isaiah they who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up like eagles and flies. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Uh, the development is scary. You know, we all start off in Christian service, flying like eagles. Then we're kind of running with it. And then we're just about making it. And, but she picked up a point. If you take time to wait upon the Lord, to do the kind of contemplative praying that she was talking about, being still, saying nothing, hearing nothing, just opening yourself up, making yourself available to God, allowing God to permeate your being, to flow into you. Whoa, uh, that will renew you. That will bring you back to life. And it's so interesting that she talked about the burnout she was beginning to experience until she began to pray in this new way. That's what you kind of see the invitation is to be with God and to get up and engage the world with God and, and do something about the pain and the suffering. Sometimes we just say to God, God, move this mountain, and God's going to give us a shovel and say, we're, this is something we're doing together. I want you to become a part of who I am, and, and, and I want you to become my hands and feet in the world. I hope that uh, those who watch this show understand what Red Letter Christianity is really all about. If you go to those old Bibles, the words of Jesus are highlighted in red. And in so many ways, uh, word made flesh is really getting into those red letters. The disciples hung together as brothers and sisters in Christ and went out from there to change the world. And there is a place for missions. Like, like to, to live a missional life, can, it can be right in your neighborhood, but it can also still be going into the world. You and got if it. you want to do it, word made flesh is a great place to start. Okay. And uh, I hope you enjoyed that show because uh, there's a lot more coming in other shows. So you'll be back next time with Red Letter Christians.